What do World War I, apples, and a computer hacker have in common? They're all key parts of the very, very old beef between Georgia and Georgia Tech. The Georgia-Georgia Tech football game, better known as clean, old-fashioned hate, has been played well over 100 times. Naturally, it's had lots of great and memorable football moments, from Buck Ballou leading Georgia to a 20-point comeback win in 1978, to Harrison Butker hitting a 53-yard field goal to send the game to overtime where Georgia Tech won in 2014. These teams have ruined seasons for one another, won when they weren't supposed to, and gotten coaches fired. But this beef history is going to focus on the things outside of the games, or at least adjacent to them, that make this rivalry historic. The first time these two teams were set to play each other, people were happy to put aside the stress of the world and just enjoy a football game. I mean, yeah, there were rumors that Georgia Tech was using players that weren't bona fide students, but this was 1893 and everyone was feeling a little weird. The Supreme Court had just ruled that tomatoes were legally vegetables. Of course, then Georgia Tech won that game in Athens, and well, the Georgia fans remembered those rumors. Especially when it came to player slash coach Leonard Wood, who was a doctor in the army and 33 years old. They also remembered that one of the officials was the brother of a Georgia Tech trainer, who was also playing for the team. So some of them started this chant, well, 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 who can tell? The Tex umpire has cheated like blank. You weren't allowed to say hell in the newspaper in 1893, I guess. Anyways, the chant was the comparatively nice part. Some Georgia fans started poking at the Tech players with their canes. Others threw rocks at their new friends from Atlanta. One Bulldog player supposedly pulled a knife. With the benefit of hindsight, we know that those Georgia fans totally overreacted. According to official school records, Wood had indeed enrolled at Georgia Tech on November 2nd, two days before this game. Oh, and he left the school that same month. Again, this was all in the first game Georgia and Georgia Tech had played against one another. It was the sixth football game they'd ever played combined. Georgia then went 5-0-1 in the next six games in the series. If you think this calmed their hatred, let me tell you about the Georgia-Clemson game in 1903. I promise it's relevant. That game in Athens was the season opener for both teams, and Clemson won the game easily, 29-0. Georgia's captain was not a sore loser, however. In fact, he wanted to see Clemson do even better against their next opponent, so he made them an offer. For every point they scored over 29, Georgia would buy Clemson a bushel of apples. Apparently, eating apples was the thing you did for fun at Clemson in 1903. If you guessed that Clemson's next opponent was Georgia Tech, good job! and a motivated Clemson really took it to Tech, winning 73-0 and earning 44 bushels of apples in the process. There was, however, an unexpected downside to this arrangement. Georgia Tech was so impressed by the whooping they received that they decided to hire Clemson's coach, John Heisman. At the time, Tech hadn't done much as a program, with 10 wins, 5 ties, and 32 losses in program history. Heisman changed that, making the Jackets much more competitive year to year and winning the national championship in 1917 with a team many consider to be one of the greatest of all time. Oh yeah, that's also how this rivalry got some serious parade beef. It's 1919, just before a baseball game between the two schools. In the spirit of post-war happiness, Georgia students put together a couple of parade floats. The first was a tank with Argon written on the side. The second was a car, in Georgia Tech colors and driven by someone in Georgia Tech gear. And that car had a message on it too. Georgia in France, Tech in Atlanta. This made Tech mad, really mad. And for those of you who aren't huge World War I buffs, I'll explain why. Georgia didn't field a football team in 1917 or 1918 due to student participation in the war effort. According to this note from the class of 1919, all but one of them had served in either the Army or the Navy, and many of them were part of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive in 1918, the deadliest battle in American history. Georgia Tech, on the other hand, actually saw enrollment grow to record levels during the war. That was in part due to the federal government relying on Tech as a military training ground, including a training program for pilots and, in 1918, an ROTC program that was mandatory for freshmen and sophomores. That also meant there were plenty of students on campus available to play football. 
so Tet continued its team during the war, including that 1917 championship squad. You can see why Georgia Tech might find a parade float that more or less called them cowards insulting. So insulting that they decided, nope, they were done playing Georgia in sports. And for five years, they didn't. It was another four years after that before they were willing to play Georgia in football again. But a form of revenge was waiting. The 1927 Georgia Bulldogs, known as the Dream and Wonder Team, tore through the first nine games on their schedule. Georgia Tech was coming off a bad 1926 season where they went four and five, and though they were improved, most didn't think they were on Georgia's level. Still, 40,000 fans packed a very rainy Grant Field in Atlanta to watch what they thought would be a game for the history books. And that is what they got as Tech upset Georgia 12-0. But beyond the final score, there were two pieces of trickery by Georgia Tech coach Bill Alexander that were just perfect beef additions to this rivalry. First, remember all that rain and mud? In the first half, Alexander decided to mostly avoid it. Whenever Georgia Tech got the ball on offense, he punted on first down. This was not merely to avoid turnovers and protect field position. It was a setup. Late in the second quarter, Warner Mazzell took the snap on first down. Georgia players expected him to punt the ball, but this time he threw it to quarterback Bob Durant for the first touchdown of the game. Tech scored again in the second half, though they wouldn't need it since the defense never got scored on. And that brings us to active subterfuge number two, which was a longer play by Alexander. Three weeks before this against LSU, Georgia Tech's second string started the game. They did the same thing against their next two opponents, because this was all part of the plan a tactic by Alexander to rest his starters as much as he could before the Georgia game and give them plenty of time to prepare for the dogs and the dogs in particular. This man devoted an entire month to ruining a rival's season. We need that kind of dedicated spite from coaches more today, if you ask me. And the shenanigans kept going from there. There was the near riot the cops could barely control in 1930. There were the two Georgia Tech victories in 1943 and 1944 that Georgia doesn't count in the official series record because they thought Tech had an unfair advantage thanks to World War II. There was the coal strike rumoredly encouraged by Georgia fans to keep Georgia Tech from taking the train to Athens for the game in 1946. Tech wound up chartering a plane to get around that problem. There was the time in the 50s where some Georgia Tech students reportedly tried to chop down the Chapel Bell Tower in Athens in the middle of the night. But then the Yellow Jackets made a big, bold, future-changing decision. At an SEC meeting in 1964, Georgia Tech announced they were leaving the conference they'd co-founded and going independent. They said they had no choice because they didn't like recruiting and scholarship practices within the conference, though there were some financial advantages to leaving too. The dogs weren't exactly thrilled about this. Their AD said, something will be gone from the Georgia-Georgia Tech series now. In a strictly football sense, he was kind of right. At the time Tech left the SEC, their record against Georgia was just about even. From their departure through 2017, they went 14 and 40 versus the dogs. In 19 years as an independent program, the Jackets went to six bowl games. That's half as many as they'd gone to in their last 19 seasons with the SEC. Tech tried to unring this bell in 1977 when they petitioned to return to the conference, but the remaining members voted unanimously against expansion. The Yellow Jackets wound up going to the ACC instead, and they did take home a national championship in 1990. But you don't need to share a conference to share beef. Georgia Georgia Tech can still inspire the visiting team to put the home team's landscaping in their mouths when they win. Georgia's still the school that appears in both of Tech's fight songs, and not all that respectfully. Georgia's still the team that went for a totally unnecessary touchdown on fourth and goal late in the 1993 game and got it, prompting a long, messy brawl. This is still the game that inspired one Tech student to hack into the University of Georgia's master calendar and put Get Ass Kicked by GT on it for the day of this game. Granted, he wound up sitting in an Athens jail on Christmas Eve facing felony charges for that, though eventually they wound up getting dropped. Rivalry beef should be serious, but not, you know, prison serious. Thanks for watching Beef History. If you wish this video had more football game in it, why not check out this rewinder about Boise State's legendary bowl win over Oklahoma? Or check out another great college football video.